So we are very fortunate to have, um, as you've already heard reference to this book, so we are very fortunate to have the authors of two of the chapters. The t there's only two copyright chapters in this book, and we have the authors of those two chapters. Um, professor Nagla Risk is on the far right, and she is a professor of economics from the American University in Cairo. And she's the author of chapter eight in this book. And that uh, chapter is called From De Facto Commons to Digital Commons, The Case of Egypt's Independent Music Industry. And um, to the left of Nagla is Professor Ben Sahanya, who's a professor of law at the University of Nairobi. He's author of chapter nine of the book, which is entitled Reflections on Open Scholarship Modalities and the Copyright Environment in Kenya. Okay, so We've set this up as a debate. I'm going to read you, I'm going to read you all the motion in a, in a few seconds. But we've set it up as a debate just to try to make it a little bit entertaining. Um, but obviously, I think one of the main, probably the main objective is that in the course of the debate, they'll get to reflect a little bit on the evidence that they generated in their research as presented in the book. But we really need also your uh, your help as the audience, um, and I'm also speaking to the people in, in the overflow room, we need your help as well, that after we have the debate, we have 10 minutes where we're going to invite the audience to, and I know normally uh, facilitators say we don't want people to stand up and make an argument, you must ask a question, but because it's a debate, we will let people uh, stand up and contribute to the debate, but very briefly, please. <laughs> or. You can also, and I encourage you to ask a question if you want to find out a bit more, particularly about their research. So the main idea is to have a little bit of fun and, uh, but, and to, so that people can get an idea of the kind of evidence that these two scholars and researchers uh, were able to generate with their work. So the motion is, it is up to African creators not policymakers and administrators to build the legitimacy of national copyright environments. Should I repeat that or has everybody got the motion? Okay, one more time. It is up to African creators, not policymakers and administrators, to build the legitimacy of national copyright environments. Now, taking the for side, saying that it's up to the African creators, will be Nagla Risk, and then arguing against will be uh, Professor Sahanya. So I'm going to give them each three minutes to make their opening arguments. Then they're each going to get three minutes to rebut. And then we will open it up for 10 minutes of audience uh, inputs and their responses. And then they'll have their concluding statements. So it's a little bit rapid fire. And um, I, have, uh, I have this sign, which I'm going to be holding up at one minute and and zero. Now, Nagla, you'll be able to see that, Ben. I might just be kind of leaning up like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, um, Nagla, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll get straight to the point. We don't have much time. I am going to speak for this as a creator of knowledge myself, just like uh, people around me here in the audience. As the author of a chapter, I'm going to speak the voice of the musicians I have interviewed. I'm even going to talk about the, the scholarly writers that my colleague Ben has written about in his uh, chapter. And I'm also going to talk based on what I heard from the consumer, consumers, the policymakers, uh, the stakeholders that we have interviewed uh, in my chapter. I want to talk about a reality, a reality in my part of the world, then, and I want you to think of the realities in your respective cultures. I want to talk about a thriving a cultural scene, a thriving production of knowledge, music, scholarly work, and what have you. I want to talk about uh, business models that do create de facto. The commons um, do take place in reality. Uh, I want to talk about um, a, a pace that is very much happening on the ground, access to knowledge where there's a lot of sharing, a gift culture, a lot of giving and disseminating and openness, a world where uh, creators, uh, their priority is the moral right. This is where they're very adamant about and they take religiously, where they don't really care about the economic rights. Their priority is to write, publish, create music and share and disseminate. They need to be known. This is a world where uh, I call the cheetah versus the sloth. What is going very fast is the creativity, the innovation, and the circumvention, and the unlegal sharing and copying. And what is very, very slow in responding to this 
are the legal practices. The creators of knowledge do know what they want. They know what they need, and even the, they know what their consumers want. Uh, it's, this is a world where the middleman has changed dr dr um, dramatically. Technologies have allowed a change in the production structures, in the business models, and the business models are happening. So what the law needs to do is to address these needs, address these issues, address the concerns. The life scene is very much uh, the thing to do. And to create the life scene, there are several um, uh, block, uh, you know, it's being blocked by administrative, bureaucratic, and, other, uh, and the likes. The, the law is missing the point by criminalizing uh, the copier. The law is missing the point by criminalizing youth, as Barry Lessig has said. The law should focus on how to create and disseminate knowledge emanating from the culture, the reality that is taking place, rather than create blockages in the short run and in the long run, since knowledge is an input and an output, and the creation of knowledge delves and takes in from knowledge around us. We in Egypt, in Africa, are very much we produce a wealth of knowledge, a great deal of it is informal, and by formal metrics, as was mentioned, uh, we have very, uh, we are not great, uh, we do not show up there. So we need to take in what is being produced and to produce new knowledge and blocks to this process created by the law in a one size fits all. We are beyond this in our practices, and we know what is what will work in our culture as creators, and we know what our consumers uh, do. The law should emanate organically, addressing the needs and the concerns and the realities rather than impose top-down, missing the point, and dealing with issues uh, that are uh, not relevant and not priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nath. <laughs> we'll go like this. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Uh, over to you. Yeah, really. At first, I thought, what could somebody who belongs to a discipline called an us discuss with somebody who belongs to a discipline called the dismal science? But I think she's introduced the issues very, very well. <laughs> I, three basic things as we start off. One, I have this problem that uh, where do, what do we define as an author to be? Uh, and I think once we agree on who an author is, we probably will be getting closer uh, this morning. An author, three di di different definitions, or a creator, or an innovator, or an inventor. Some think that an author is that person who has gotten a, something absolutely new from thin air, in the sense of maybe Bobby Kennedy. I dream, or some people think of things that are, see things as they are and ask why, but then an author is supposed to be those who dream of things that never are, were and ask why not. That's one definition of an author. Uh, things that never were become. Then I think that is becoming almost old-fashioned definition of an author. The second one is that uh, really nothing is new. Everybody is standing on the shoulders of others. And in patent law, they talk of uh, the quote from Isaac Newton, if I've been able to see far, it's because I stood on the shoulders of others. And uh, I think the best examples that have been given by Lessig and others is that uh, uh, Disney did not create Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse pre-existed, it only re refined it, etc., etc. That's another definition of an author, which is basically that we are building on what has been done by others, and that that's the beauty of the creative commons. Then the other one is that none of those is suitable, and we should really look for another definition of an author in the modern age and see how copyright can be calibrated to fit into this. In other words, we cannot totally dismiss copyright the way uh, some of our economists, not my colleague, but some, <laughs> tend, <laughs> tend to do. The second question which we really uh, found uh, interesting in, uh, in the Kenyan context was then what is the role of copyright in this process? One, that copyright, a good, strong copyright law is good for creativity, innovation, and access. The, because before you uh, consume, it must be produced. That's one argument that I've seen out there. The other the issue is that copyright is actually so negative, and especially strong copyright. And there's a point that uh, my colleague has ably made in her paper and in this presentation, that copyright can be very, very negative, and in fact, we should not. Then others argue that copyright sometimes is neutral. And then that, that leads me really to my last point before I hear the bell or Chris next to me, <laughs> is that uh, 
Well, I think this is becoming a more nuanced discussion. And the beauty of this research, both the papers that I have read, the, all the chapters and also our two chapters, what I'm reading is that we are all going to the same pro point and the presentations before us. That probably intellectual property and copyright is becoming a lo lot more complex, a lot more nuanced. And I think we need to do more work. The example of the Creative Commons, surprise, surprise to some of you. I interviewed Paul Goldstein when I visited Stanford this October. And he says the best thing that has happened to copyright is the Creative Commons because it has taught us that copyright is not about greed. And I would leave it at that point for now. Thank you. <laughs> OK, now they're each going to have three minutes to rebut each other's opening statements. And uh, Nagla, over to you. Thank you. I just want to make something clear. I am not dismissing copyright. Uh, all I'm saying is that we need to create a protection that responds and addresses the needs of a culture. We heard Toby earlier saying that uh, very, uh, very uh, well said that we should not f uh, replace a one-size-fits-all top-down by a one-size-fits-all the opposite argument. What we need is suitable protection for this community. And, and what we need in Egypt will be diff may be different from what is needed in Kenya and elsewhere. So I want to make this very clear. For example, Creative Commons is a form of protection. But I argue that this is more suitable for the commons-based culture and the knowledge and information economy that exists in my uh, country. So um, uh, also, we need to regulate this in a way that, that uh, really brings the users and the producers of knowledge closer, that releases the, the well-known access versus incentives debate in a way that responds to the cultures. I think once you do that, we can actually um, do away or eliminate the need for infringement once it is uh, the, the law is, is responding to organic needs of the culture and the context, it's contextualized, then uh, we can um, uh, use our resources instead of um, using resources to continuously fight piracy, which I think is, uh, is, a is the wrong fight. We should use those resources to devise business models that are suitable for that culture, where protection is there, but in a way that promotes knowledge production, which is the ultimate aim rather than I being an end in itself. To give you a very quick example, if we want to promote the cultural industries in Egypt based on what I've seen, what is really in need is the promotion of the life scene. There is a shortage of venues. There are b tremendous bureaucratic hurdles in the face of young musicians. To, for example, they have to be members of a syndicate. And to be members of the musician syndicate takes forever. So some of the musicians actually do give up. And the life scene is the number one uh, venue for their promotion. So basically, we look for models that work with a freemium where they're bundling the free versus the paid for models where economic rights are met and addressed, but in a way that, that meets the needs and responds to the realities rather than coming up with suggestions that are alien to the culture. Um, I think in the end, we should always keep in mind the objective. The objective is we want to promote knowledge for development. We want to promote research, science, scholarly publishing, creative industries, and all forms of other knowledge for human development. We should not, we should keep that in mind and look for ways that encourage the development of, in a context where uh, the, the, it is about people in the end, and it is a people of a particular culture. And this is where the law should come from and should keep pace with the changes that are happening very dynamically, I must, uh, I must add, in the context of the technological developments in this day and time. Thank you. I, I think we are seeing a convergence of points, and I really appreciate that concession. Uh, so, so I know I start from the perspective that uh, uh, risk starts from. Basically, the default is freedom, not the default isn't control. In my work in copyright and consider democracy now, the default must be freedom, access, rather than control. So is all relevant? Yes, there is consensus. It's relevant, so I'll not belabor the point. I wanted to focus on it. Because at, at, do institutions matter, or do we see institutions are, as barriers? Institutions matter. So the question is not whether we need institutions or administrative and policy frameworks. It's the quality of those institutions that we really would matter. Because I've seen the literature, and I used to review some of it, that the more we talked in Africa, and in the rest of the world in the late 80s, early 90s, about the reg deregulation, the more we talked of re-regulation and creating new institutions to 
emphasize deregulation. So the issue is, for me, is about the quality of these institutions, such as the AG's office uh, uh, for those countries that copyright is under the Attorney General's office, the CMOs, collective management organizations, some of which are self-regulatory to, to, to some extent, uh, the education and entertainment uh, institutions, whether in government or in the private and public sector, as the debate by Tobias and others in the morning tend indicated, we need these institutions. We need them to be more efficient and to be more equitable to help us uh, manage and govern uh, copyright. Uh, is the law sometimes being seen as uh, irrelevant and as uh, a difficult uh, casing too much difficult? Yes, but the law is always there in so many of the things that we do. Even the area of uh, Creative Commons, we are already seeing the licensing regimes in some cases being backed up by law in some countries. And I think that uh, the, to the extent that we cannot trust all to conform to certain practices, <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that we cannot, uh, uh, not everybody will conform to those practices. We will always need the law. We will need, always need the uh, institutions. We will always need the police, for instance, because the law is made for the bad guys who are unlikely, who are likely to call to pollute the pool, as it is said in the Creative Commons. So as we move forward, I think there is a lot of we are getting much closer, the economists and the lawyers, on this debate on the need to really see how we can build greater consensus in terms of policy, in terms of rules, in terms of institutions, to institutionalize the creative commons uh, in Africa, whether you are in Kenya, in Egypt, in South Africa, in Nigeria, and that there's a lot of evidence also from Ghana that a lot needs to be done in these areas as we move forward. Thank you. Um, so do we have any people from the audience who would like to join the debate or ask a question? I'm Yusuf Vada from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I have a question for Nakhla, is it right? Uh, you talked about context, and I'm wondering whether another argument could not be made for less regulation in this area of copyright, uh, given the geopolitical situation that you find yourself in, you know, in transitional society. For example, could it be argued that increasing regulation in this sort of area could fuel, you know, regulation and control of uh, other areas of expression and freedom of thought and so on? So I think uh, uh, sort of in the context of what you're experiencing. Oh, you want to answer? Okay. Well, thank you for the question. It's, you have touched on a sensitive uh, chord, so I'll try to answer very briefly, but I think we can have a longer discussion after the session. Uh, when we talk about freedom of expression in Egypt, it becomes a very long story. Uh, just my answer to you, and I don't know if that answers your question, in our fight right now, in um, my own advocacy work uh, in, in, during the, the current state of Egypt, I, I can tell you for sure that I am advocating for uh, freedom of information. This is an area where I work uh, very uh, strongly in, as well as uh, advocating for the presence of open source software, which is it's a big triumph for us, and now it is part of, actually, there is a national strategy that I just sent before coming. So to answer your question very quickly in this context is, it does happen that uh, I, the fact remains I'm not advocating for uh, IP issues or less regulation or more regulation as such much as I believe in this issue. I find myself absorbed into maybe the, the, the wider spectrum of freedom of information, which in a way is related. Um, we, d we just had a new uh, constitutional draft, and it does talk about intellectual property. And I know Hela and I are not happy about this, the constitutional article that says that intellectual property is very important, and this, the state will create a body that will, co you know, coordinate that or ensure that. So, which of course is is a very uh, superficial way to address the subject. It is not, for better or for worse, it's not tackled in and of itself in the debates that are happening. You are right. There is. It's a very complex geopolitical situation right now and issues of freedom of expression are taking uh, you know, priority, not to say that IP is not a freedom issue, but the fact remains that we are really engrossed into so many discussions that this per se was not on the immediate agenda, uh, sadly. I mean, we would have wanted to do more in our advocacy, but there's only you know, so much energy we have. But thank you for the question, and I'm happy to discuss further beyond this uh, session.
Um, I was intrigued by Ben's sort of final statement. Uh, we always need the law, it's needed for the bad guys. Now, that from somebody who lives in South Africa is actually quite problematic. But more so, I find it problematic in copyright. Because who are the bad guys? The original copyright formulation was that copyright was there to protect the rich and powerful from the hordes of hoi polloi who should be prevented from reading things. These days, are the bad guys not the big and powerful corporations, the geopolitics of keeping the developing world exactly where it is, the MOOCs that promote knowledge from the US and foist it on us? Um, how does one play that particular scenario? So that's... Uh, that statement is itself intriguing. Isn't it? When I made it, it intrigued me, and I was so, not so sure that I should say it in this forum. But I thought that I wanted to move on to the next level of, in this debate. The evidence from my work and the evidence from uh, Egypt, from this work, indicates that scholars are willing to do their work and are not too emphatic on the money issue. Musicians are willing to do that creative piece, and the main uh, issue is not that I'll get paid for it. They enjoy the work they do. And, but then there is always this problem, the bad guys phenomenon. There are people who are out there to exploit both categories of people. Somebody is getting money out of this process. You are a scholar, you are enjoying your work, you are willing to give your students for free, etc. But there is that bureau that's really photocopying these materials and somebody is making money out of you. You are a musician in Egypt and you are really keen on doing this work. There is that person out there who is either electronic, using digital technologies or other technologies and who is getting a, a benefit out of it. This is part of the bad guy phenomenon. And unless we change human nature, the law will always be necessary. The question is how equitable and efficient the law is, not whether we, the law is necessary. I think one of the things I appreciate about the Creative Commons is this, and I know some of my the, the, part of the audience may be wondering whether I have had a change of heart overnight. No. <laughs> uh, 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 I, in the last few year, years, especially with this work that included methodological research, and we appreciate this opportunity from open air system, I realized that uh, you can, we can no longer say yes and no in copyright. No copyright law, yes to copyright law. I think the question is more nuanced. It must be to that level of how do we, our, how does our law accommodate the sharing aspect with the aspect of propertization or commodification of what we have created. That, to me, is a delicate balance which cannot be answered in a yes or no that many times we debate in intellectual property. It's a more nuanced situation. And, and my, one of the arguments that I've looked at since last night is that probably Creative Commons is becoming very important, partly because it's a logical and pragmatic way to approach copyright. It's more practical and pragmatic. Rather than uh, the enclosure movement, those who really wanted more and more property in copyright, or the freeloader movement, which is sharing people's work, sharing, without taking into account the fact that these guys have invested quite a lot of time and skill in doing this work. So I think the Creative Commons, and with its gradations and nuances and various permutations, is a more realistic way. The bad guys we will always have with us. Just as I said, the poor will always have with us. The bad guys will always be there. And we need law to strike this balance. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Carol Dury. I'm from the University of Stellenbosch, but also from Kenya. Um, my question is to Dr. D uh, ben Sihanya, which is, um, you're seeing a lot of innovation um, or innovators going towards Creative Commons. Do you, are you seeing legislators now looking into innovative ways in which they can perhaps change the laws, you know, in line with what they're seeing with regards to like Creative Commons, or in, you know, as as what, uh, uh, especially responding to the informal sectors. So, you know, uh, what was discussed before in in ways in which um, Africans are sharing things without uh, necessarily, you know, doing it within the limits of the law. Uh, really excellent. That's something I had, had thought of addressing, but uh, either I 
wasn't quick enough or Chris harassed me, either of the two. Uh, <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> so the point is that really, let me take Kenya. In Kenya, Kenya Copyright Board mobilized stakeholders, and Dr. Maricela Uma is here. If I say anything wrong, she'll correct me instantly. <laughs> Kenya Copyright Board mobilized people to see how we can have a more creative way to copyright in the sense of like providing access to on issues such as braille and related issues on limitations and ex exceptions limitations and exceptions so that we define rights much more clearly we define limitations and much more clearly so that we the the the, the, the producers of knowledge and the users can be clearer this work has been there for about more than two, three years, and we were discussing that with Chris this morning. But it has not moved very far, partly because of two reasons. Our MPs, and you said you come from Kenya, our legislators don't regard, one, they don't get it. One, they just don't get that this thing is important and we need to take intellectual property seriously in the sense of the balance, not in the sense of our protection. But they really don't get that thing. And it's not urgent to them. And as a, hey, no, that's not for me. And, <laughs> and then, as you know from Kenya, instead of legislating on these issues, they have been focusing more on how to stifle NGOs, how to do more VAT, how to give themselves more, more money. These drafts have been there for a long time. So I think it is the work of this forum moving forward to create a movement to go to the next point of policy making and legislation at national institutional levels. Because I can also challenge us. Most of our institutions still don't have a clear uh, creative commons policy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that let us work on policy making at national institutional and legislation, national policy, uh, national institutional levels. Thank you. Yes, uh, bad guys can be good guys. Yes. Because bad guys give free service to disseminate an idea. So yes. some of the musicians, let's quote one here from South Africa, Miriam Makeba. When you listen actually to her songs, I'm sure she was happy that people copy cut it in Soweto and other places to communicate an issue to a community. So if I have copycats, people who copy and sell, it's okay because he disseminates for me. He gives me a free service because I have something to say to the world and I don't have the money to do it myself, but my music will bring it. So that could be one argument where the musicians are happy we copied, and maybe people make money out of it, but it's fine. Yes, I would, as a matter of fact, in Egypt, this is precisely the case, that musicians are very happy when their music is, is shared, and you know, and it always makes them, it's a, also a way, even if you take it from a pure um, economic rights issue, it's a way to promote them, because their bread and butter comes from the live scene. So on the moral aspect, they're very happy that their music as a you know, means of expression. But also, even if you go to the very utilitarian, you know, it's, it is a way to promote them, you know, to promote their message and to promote them as, as artists. And then they get to do uh, what brings them the dough at the end of the day. So there's nothing wrong with that. S sorry, but I don't know whether that a lot of that is still based on anecdotal evidence. Because that was what the hunch out there. But I think talking to so many of the musicians, I don't have clear empirical evidence on this. Increasing musicians, that you know, in Kenya are becoming, having agents. They are looking at the business models, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is mainly based on a hunch, on anecdotal evidence. It's not that they are celebrating when other people are benefiting from their music by just selling it, especially selling it. Using it for charity, maybe. But when they are selling it, that becomes a different ballgame. Thank to, you. Sorry, actually, it's based on research. This is the sample that we have had of the musicians that we have uh, you know, interviewed across the board. This is not just for this research, but for a previous Maybe one. in Egypt, not in Kenya. And, uh, and <laughs> 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 so the, the, the real debate has finally begun. <laughs> so let's, we've got a few more minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, just a comment and then a question. Um, I think a comment, just that we should probably be a bit more careful about this debate, um, because I think music is a very distinct industry, and it functions very differently from our traditional uh, copyright industry. So it's really difficult, I think, to extrapolate what's happening in the music industry and generalize it. So just sort of a word of caution about that. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to push my good friend uh, Nagla a bit and um, her colleague. What existed before copyright? What did African creators do before copyright? Actually, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the music. Uh, uh, in my teaching of the economics of intellectual property, there is always one thread that links different forms of knowledge. You are right that music is one form of knowledge, but the tension between access and incentives and the tension between vertical uh, hierarchical structures been, built around maximal IP protection as opposed to horizontal platforms that are based on the community is very much there in different forms in software, in book publishing, and our incentives for publishing are certainly not to make money, but to get known and you know, to get our reputation. So where there may be differences between the different types of knowledge, there is a thread that really links the different forms. And again, I'm happy to discuss this further. So I don't feel uncomfortable bringing the example of the creative in the music just because it's in the chapter, but I have done work on other areas and there's very much a similar logic in all of them. In fact, it's also similar to politics, which is what I will talk about in a few days in my keynote. The second point is, I, I, I appreciate your question, but I want to pose another question. What existed before copyright in the developed world? Right? How did the developed world create their knowledge? How did Europe and the USA create their knowledge? Was there a TRIPS agreement then, or was there free <laughs> sharing, borrowing, stealing, what have you? I think that's the question to ask. And we are, as developing countries, being put in this position. We really need to think very careful about our priorities and where do we need to go from there. I am not against copyright, I mean, this will be my, I'm not against copyright per se. I'm just looking for what is suitable for us in the same way when there was open knowledge and open sharing in Europe, and in fact in Asia as well, in the, you know, the so-called Asian tigers, they didn't face what we are facing today. So I leave the answer to the question maybe to my colleague, but I, I'd like the audience to think about that as well. Thank you. Yeah, so this has been a debate, and uh, in earlier work, like in my doctorate, I looked at this problem, because I've had a rumor out there that intellectual property is relevant to Africa, I'm glad that that rumor is being debunked, especially in this forum. Uh, copyright has always been relevant. It has always been there in Africa. And indeed, there is a lady who was doing quite original work on these issues in Ethiopia. Unfortunately, she died a while ago. But my own little research on this has indicated that in our communities, in most of our communities, there were people who had composed songs and they performed these songs. And it was known as a song of so-and-so, which means that there is paternity right. And secondly, from an economic perspective, they would be given a goat to go and sing during a funeral or a wedding, which means that there were economic rights in copyright. And I can go to even to trademark where we, people branded pots and spears. So the issue is, the question is that now you are putting intellectual property in a, more, in a wider context, where the bad guys are more. The environment more more complex. It is a transnational commerce, mass economy, etc. That's why where now we talk of trips being important with its flexibilities. We, where, that's where we talk about national legislation being important. But copyright has always been there in Africa. It's not an import from anywhere. Thank you. <coughs> Charles Batamza is my name. Um, I come from Uganda and. Uh, Part of what I do is to promote uh, what she's doing in Egypt, free and whatever. But also part of what I do is to deal with the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had over 40 years since independence when copyright was not enforced. Eh? And uh, in terms of uh, enhancing creativity in my country, Uganda, I can say we didn't do much. Uh, and uh, part of the reason, for instance, why the law had to be revised was because creators were really very concerned that they were not getting anything. Because for them, the initial idea, the reason why they got into creating music or books or whatever was so that they could earn something. Eh? But because the environment was open and everybody was free to do whatever they wanted, these people could not do earn as much as they desired. Eh? And for that reason then, we, we got to revise the law and put in place mechanisms so the law could be enforced. And even up to this point, actually people like the kind of musicians you have in Egypt, the informal ones and so on, when they're interviewed in the newspapers, they say, oh yeah, my God, we are not getting anything from our industry, um, our creativity. We wish government could 
actually enforce mm -hmm. the law so that we're able to earn something. Um, the reason I'm bringing this is to show that uh, um, I, I think economic interest in a work of creativity evolved. Maybe initially you started just for purposes of propagating an idea or just entertainment, but eventually you want to, to make some money. And that's the reason why um, what the professor is saying, we probably need to, to, to look at the institutions, we need to look at um, all those makers, mechanisms in place to ensure people earn something and therefore develop Africa. A, a quick one on that. I saw from your study and also from your presentation, but I also saw it from my own. This statement that goes that most of the creators, many of the creators, not most, many of the creators don't know the mechanics and the specific details of copyright and may not even be aware of the, that the Copyright Act exists. But then does this, that mean the copyright law is irrelevant? No. Many landowners may not say to you what provision of the law deals with trespass, but they know trespass is wrong. So I think that we really have to be a, have a nuanced perspective on these issues. The fact that they are not increasingly aware of all the provisions of copyright law or utilize them daily does not necessarily mean that the law is irrelevant because many of them are working under the shadow of the law. Collective management organizations are established under the shadow of the law. Some of these musicians belong to those organizations. So they were, are working under the shadow of the law. The law is still very relevant. The question is equity and efficiency. Free sharing has proved to be very beneficial, not only to musicians, but also filmmakers. We have actually one of our filmmakers in Tanzania uh, who actually visited uh, DRC Congo in, simply because actually a lot of his, his films were shared a lot before visiting there, actually, when he went there, the cloud actually, actually were um, actually um, very immersive. So basically what happens actually, there are a lot of them actually knew about him before even he went there, but he had never had sold actually his, his films in, 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 uh, in DRC Congo. So basically, of course, there's a, uh, there's a number of course of evidence-based research. I'm happy actually to share with you maybe in the course of time. I can just say hallelujah, but uh, I don't think that uh, I don't think that proves very much. <laughs> I think it depends on specific people interviewed and the sectors. <laughs> I think it proves a lot when you have evidence-based research based on research on the ground in more than one country. It certainly is worth looking at. It certainly is worth realizing and, and translating this into practical laws that will not be circumvented and that will not be ignored and that will not be irrelevant because if it's relevant, then if people respect it and oh. people will work with it rather than you know uh, denying just because you know we think it's not based on no, no i'm not denying i'm yeah. saying that no. sharing has nuances even creative commons has nuances different Sorry. levels of sharing etc <laughs> hello my name is rami Olwan. i come from the united arab emirates i think um, most of our laws are out of touch with reality mm. and uh, i like what uh, najla said about uh, making sense of the laws and really, we need that because many people believe that our copyright laws are, does, does not make sense in any way. Mm. I think we need more kind of combination between uh, economists and lawyers to draft better laws. Mm. And I think this is missing. Yes. I, need, I think also we need some coordination between African countries in relation to, uh, to their experience about copyright laws and how they can benefit each other. There are some good laws and there are some sen laws which are sensitive to culture. Um, issued, but there isn't some coordination. And also the civil society, um, I think we, uh, maybe you should comment on some of those issues if you can, and how can we bring both together? Your, your two approaches, I think, extreme approaches, I think this what's what makes sense uh, to make these laws better um, for everyone and make sense at the end of the day. Thank you. Now, I want to, I want to thank that gentleman because he's helping to bring the two debaters together that they can share. <laughs> Share ideas, and I think we do want to hesitate before we start cutting into the tea breaks, which we yes. are now into the tea okay. break. Mm. So, if you guys each want to say something more, it's got to be very brief. That's the closing yeah. remarks. But yes. Okay. Very quickly, I am not against copyright. Okay. I am against maximal copyright and a copyright that's detached from reality. I am not against um, the economic return. Everybody needs to make a living. I am against putting a price tag on a good that is much more complex than dealing, that's a public good in, in essence, a knowledge good in general. And putting a price tag deals with it like a private good, which is very limiting and again detached from reality. 
I'm not against the private sector. Actually, a lot of businesses can grow and thrive around the, the, you know, the commons of the, the sharing of knowledge, especially small businesses, which is what you need, rather than large conglomerates built around monopolies and protection, maximal protection of knowledge. The distinction between the producer and the consumer of knowledge is blurred. That's absolutely correct. And the poten there's tremendous potential for knowledge production that will be blocked by a copyright law that is detrimental to openness and sharing and that is really detached from the needs uh, of the people. What, what is needed is copyright that is flexible, responsive, inclusive, and this is why precisely it has to listen to the creators of knowledge as much as the users, but more so the creators, which is the motion, really will build the uh, legitimacy of a national copyright environment, will we'll talk to, will feed, and will bring in the, the, the essence of a proper copyright law, the flexible that responds to the needs of the people for the purpose of promoting knowledge for development. That's you can see I'm moving next to her. <laughs> uh, because I agree. Yeah, thank you. I agree, I agree that uh, really the devil then is in the details. So three, four things. One, please let us uh, uh, clarify the copyright laws, working with economists, with civil society organizations, private sector, government agencies. We've tried that in Kenya. We hope that the drafts will see the light of day soon. Let us clarify the rights, that's one. Two, let us clarify the limitations and exceptions. Uh, I, I, given the new developments, the concerns for persons with disability, especially with visual impairment and others, uh, let us also take into account the new digital environment, which makes sharing much more complicated. It's not the typical sharing that we had, but in some, some cases, the people are uh, really polluting the pool in this regard. The bad guys are becoming more, and they are becoming more aggressive, more lethal to the creators. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, not mine. No, that's, that is, lastly, that's the bell. Lastly, the Creative Commons gives us a good opportunity in terms of legislation and policy making. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Hey, so, thank, thank you very much both to Nagla and Ben.